Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'd first like to thank the Worshipful Master of Cornerstone Lodge No. 711, Worshipful Kenneth Skyer, as well as, as well as Cornerstone's immediate past master and current Lodge Secretary, Worshipful Brother Jonathan Williams, for arranging this lecture and my presence at the Civil War reenactment tomorrow here at Museum Village. I'd also like to thank the members of Cornerstone Lodge No. 711 and the Cornerstone Masonic Historical Society for the honor of speaking with you tonight and for the courtesies extended to me this weekend. Many thanks are also due to the Museum Village for hosting this lecture and congratulations to them for, for their 41st annual Civil War reenactment. It's so wonderful to see you all here tonight and I look forward to a fun and interesting day tomorrow. Tonight, I will be discussing two main topics. First, the resources of the Livingston Masonic Library, so that you have a background for where this artifact comes from. And second, the remarkable history of one of the artifacts found therein. My name is Catherine M. Walter, and for over 13 years, it has been my honor, privilege, and pleasure to serve as the curator of the Chancellor Robert R. Livingston Masonic Library of the Grand Lodge of New York. I'm also very pleased to introduce one of the members of our Library Board of Trustees here in attendance tonight, Right Worshipful Marlon Thomas. Uh, I am an anthropologist, and before being hired to organize and catalog the artifact collection of the Grand Lodge of New York, the three previous storerooms I brought into order were at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City those being the African, the Great Plains, and the Great Basin ethnographic storerooms. So before even starting at the Livingston Masonic Library and Museum, I had already stabilized close to 100,000 mu museum artifacts. New York State Freemasons should know how much of their heritage is within those four walls of the Livingston Masonic Library, and just waiting to be tapped. For non-Masons who are history buffs, the rich genealogical and text resources and the historical significance of the holdings are unparalleled. There are over 60,000 books in the library division, which also has extensive archives and which is open to the general public. And there are over 50,000 artifacts in the museum division. There is a lot of material in our collections. Almost all of it was donated to the library and museum by Masonic brethren and their families ever since 1885. At that time, the first Grand Lodge Masonic Hall at 23rd Street had been in place for 10 years. It was then when Deputy Grand Master Frank R. Lawrence formed the Library and Reading Room Committee to take charge of books and papers, which had begun to accumulate. In 1886, Grandmaster William A. Brody formed the Committee of On Antiquities to take charge of the relics and curios found within the books. Today, 131 years later, the books, archives, and artifacts are an intertwined, cross-referencing treasure trove of data with material about some of the most prominent figures and events in New York, the United States, and world history. There is also a lot of material about New York State men who are prominent in the fraternity and those who were not, but all of whose cumulative life stories made a consistent theme across the fabric of New York State history. So what does a collection of over 100,000 historic Masonic items mean to New York State Masons? Main, many people find history to be dull. But within the Masonic community, there's perhaps a greater appreciation for it, as there, exists, as there exists a strong bond between brethren that transcends time. The brothers today are going through the same rituals and traveling the same knowledge-seeking paths as their brothers from 1717, and at least symbolically, reaching back in time to dates far earlier. 1717, however, is the date of the formation of the Grand Lodge of England, which is now known as the United Grand Lodge of England. And 1717 is considered to be the beginning of the fraternal structure of protocol and ritual, 
which regular Freemasonry across the world follows today. Certainly, Freemasonry existed before 1717. The current form of the fraternity grew out of the operative stonemasons of the medieval period, those men who built the cathedrals of Europe. But their rituals of membership became codified in 1723 with a book called Anderson's Constitutions. The first Masonic book published in the United States was the 1734 printing of Anderson's Constitutions by none other than Benjamin, brother Benjamin Franklin. In that same year, he was serving as Provincial Grand Master of Pennsylvania, an office he filled again in 1749. And by the way, the Livingston Library has a copy of this rare printing, as well as three copies of the original 1717 Andersons, one with a tipped in letter to the Duke of Montague, to whom the book was dedicated. All of this history and so much more can be found in the Livingston Masonic Library, with original source materials and obscure holdings. If you are a New York State Master Mason, there is a free reading course program with almost 100 titles that circulate around the state. You can sign up for these self-directed courses, each of which focuses on a different aspect of Freemasonry, like ones for newly raised Masons, to others for becoming an officer, there's an esoteric course and history courses, to name a few of the 17 offered. As we are a state chartered library, non-Masons, women, and children are welcome to utilize our resources on site. And while we have many circulating books not on the reading course, both Masons and non-Masons need to come to the library in person to access the rare volumes and archives in our care. Digitization plans are underway to give even further access. Most of our books come from the mid-1800s, and cumulatively, they, along with the archives and artifacts, represent the holdings of one of the finest rare book libraries and research centers in the world, focused on Freemasonry and on New York State and United States history. For the artifact collection of the museum division, there is less which is available in a hands-on fashion. But in visiting the Grand Lodge Masonic Hall in New York, there are 39 exhibit cases around the building, there is also a branch in, of the library and museum in Utica, New York, where there are many beautiful and significant artifacts on display, including several very amazing tracing boards. Additionally, there are over 600 artifacts and biographies that I've put into our online museum, with very high definition photographs and with extensive research done for many of them. The online artifacts only show a tiny part of our collection. But the new librarian, Ms. Morgan, I, Ms. Morgan Aronson, and I are working on a digital portal which will bring not only the books, but the artifacts to the public in a much broader fashion. So, out of 50,000 artifacts, what's the big deal with one little artifact such as this one? Sometimes, it's a lot. The jewelry, uh, sorry. the jewelry sub collection includes many items for which there are no spectacular history attached, and many for which the history has yet to be discovered, or often rediscovered, as much of the history of Freemasonry in New York State, which was once well known, has been lost to time. This is a result of many things. Traditional stories are lost as brothers pass away and no one thought to interview them and write their oral histories. Artifact histories once on display were lost in time or separated from their paperwork. And frankly, interest in history has waned as smartphones, televisions, video games, and computers have taken away most people's free time. So when an artifact's history has been lost, it's very, very exciting for a curator to reconnect an artifact and its history. That's exactly what happened with this pendant. It's such a small artifact, and yet there is so much meaning in it. It is covered with Masonic symbols, but that would be another lecture entirely, and one I'm not really qualified to give. 
But when I first worked on this artifact, its original identifying number had been lost. And so the initials carved into the bottom, WCL, meant nothing to me. All I knew was that it was carved with the symbols of a royal arch masonry. I cataloged it, photographed it, tagged it, and I put it away. Several years later, I was working on jewelry which once belonged to Right Worshipful Orrin Welch, a very active Syracuse-based mason. Sometime after his death in 1878, Mrs. Mary Welch donated three pendants to the museum, two Scottish Rite and one Royal Arch. They were numbered in the old catalog system as C64, 65, and 67. Well, when I came to the description for C66, I said, I know which piece this is. And I was on the road to connecting the history back to the artifact. When thinking about Freemasonry, the first things that come to my mind are brotherhood and charity, not necessarily bravery and heroism. But that's what the history of this pendant has revealed about its owner and carver. On the original artifact record, three small index cards with sparse information, it states that it was carved by a brother named W.C. Lilly while serving in the Union Army during the Civil War. A name. Having a name associated with an artifact is huge, and it is the reason why I recommend to all modern Masons that they have their name and dates engraved on the back of any jewel or medal they receive or buy or wear. Otherwise, over time, the item's history is much more at risk for being lost, and so is yours. I think in a hundred year terms, and I try to think of the curators who will come after me. They will be very appreciative to have your names and dates on the artifacts associated with you. Once I had W.C. Lilly's name, I began to search for his story. The Livingston Masonic Library maintains records going back to the earliest days of Freemasonry in New York State. There are lodge returns, charters, annual proceedings for various bodies, biographical files, subject files, lodge files, lodge histories printed in book format and handwritten in small ledgers, archives filled with manuscripts and documents, minute books, bound newspapers and periodicals, membership logs, and of course, artifacts belonging to the members. I think of the artifact storeroom as a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle, with each artifact showing a tiny part of the whole picture of Freemasonry in New York State, and the history of each brother's life as one small piece of the overall understanding of this ancient and honorable institution. In researching one artifact out of 50,000, I will end up searching all areas where I might glean one date, one name, one lodge membership, one tiny point of data, but there comes a point where I must stop. I can't do the in-depth research that's often done on television shows such as History Detectives, but our records do often give much more information than you might find anywhere else. In the following, Please note that as I describe the story of this pendant and the brother who made it, I will be referencing resources and sources which are available afterwards to anyone interested. Brother Lilly was born in 1829 in Schenectady, New York. At 20 years old in 1849, having moved to Syracuse, New York, he married Mary Newberry. Childless, in 1851, they adopted a two-year-old boy naming him William H. Lilly. At the age of 28, while working in Syracuse as a switch tender for the newly forming railroad industry, he became a master mason in Syracuse Lodge Number 102. Five months later, he joined Central City Chapter Number 70 of the Royal Arch Masons in Syracuse. A year and seven months later, in 1860, he affiliated with Central City Lodge Number 305, also in Syracuse. Royal Arch Masonry is part of the York Rite, which is a concordant body of Freemasonry. For those not familiar with Freemasonry, the numerous concordant bodies provide brethren who have passed the three degrees of a Blue Lodge with additional pathways of intellectual light for increasing their knowledge of both Masonic and lifetime topics. 
There are many concordant bodies, but the main three are the York Rite, which has Royal Archmasons, Royal and Select Masters, and the Knights Templar. There is also the Scottish Rite, with degrees going up to the Honorary 33rd, and then there's the Ancient Arabic Order of Nobles of the Mystic Shrine, or Shriners, perhaps the most visible of the Masonic bodies. The Shriners support 21 hospitals around the country that give free care to children 18 and younger with burns and neuro neurological disorders. So at age 33, four years after becoming a Freemason, Brother Lilly joined the Union Army in August of 1862 as a corporal. Seven months later, this is Brother Lilly, by the way. Seven months later, in March of 1863, he was promoted to color sergeant, the soldier carry, charged with carrying the flag of the Union. To quote James R. Brand, Color sergeant was a dangerous but coveted position in Civil War regiments, generally manned by the bravest soldier in the unit. Brother Lilly served as a color sergeant for the New York State Volunteers 149th Infantry, which was recruited in Onondaga County and organized in Syracuse. It mustered in on September 18, 1862, and mustered out on June 12, 1865. The regiment fought First, with no losses, near Ripon, Virginia in November of 1862 and at Charleston, West Virginia in December of 1862. They then joined General and Masonic brother George B. McClellan's army, serving in the 3rd Brigade with Major General and Masonic brother John W. Geary's 2nd Division, 12th Corps. They fought at the Battle of Chancellorsville in Virginia, where Brother Lilly was slightly wounded before going to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and defending Culp's Hill during the Battle of Gettysburg. <coughs> Among the vast resources of the Livingston Library's collections, this, this map you can see later, it's a little too far to see from that distance, uh, among the vast resources in the Livingston Library's collections, there is a complete set of the Civil War official records titled The War of the Rebellion, a compilation of the official records of the Union and Confederate armies prepared under the direction of the Secretary of War by Robert N. Scott and published pursuant to an act of Congress approved June 16, 1880. Now, when I learned William C. Lilly was a Civil War soldier, I thought, let me check the index of the official records of the Civil War, but I sincerely doubted that I would find anything. To my great surprise, he was in the index. Turning to the page indicated, the event memorialized were described as follows by the regiment's commanding officer and brother, Colonel Henry A. Barnum, a Masonic brother also from Syracuse Lodge No. 102, in his report to Captain C.P. Horton. This is what he said. On July 2nd, 1863, at about 9.30 p.m., the enemy, repulsed in his every effort, withdrew. The regiment was relieved at about 10 p.m., but remained immediately in rear of the trenches during the night. At about 4 a.m. of the 3rd, the regiment was again put into the trenches and had barely settled into position when the enemy again furiously attacked us. His charges were most impetuous and his fire terrific. Twice was our flag shot down, and a rebel first sergeant, in a brave attempt to capture it, fell within two feet of the prostrate banner, pierced with five balls. The flag's record of the bloody contest is 81 balls through its field and stripes, and seven in its staff. Each time it fell, the color sergeant, William C. Lilly, spliced the staff and again placed it upon the works and received a slight wound in doing so. Brother Lilly's bravery showed in his retrieving the flag from the other side of the breastworks amidst fierce fire from an enemy five times their size. He repaired it by wrapping his knapsack strap around the staff and used wood slats from cracker or ammunition boxes to stabilize it. This flag was the symbol and pride of the regiment 
and of their home, Onondaga County. The flag was described as follows. The flag is of the best silk, made of the regulation dimensions, bordered with heavy yellow silk fringe, and the 34 stars in the field richly embroidered. Across the middle of the stripes was the inscription, presented to the, to the 149th Regiment, NYSV, by the officers of Onondaga Salt Springs, September 1862. An extension staff for this elegant flag is mounted with an elaborate golden eagle, just below which hang rich bullion cords and tassels. The flag and its attachments are of the best quality and manufacture. It co its cost was about $100. The defense of Culp's Hill and the bravery of Green's 12th Corps men maintained the safety of the Union's right flank, as well as the route of supplies and communication along the Baltimore Pike. Although Brother Lilly was slightly wounded at Gettysburg after his first wound in Chancellorsville, he continued fighting and was next sent with the 12th Corps three months later in October to fight the October 28th and 29th battle in Wahatchee, Tennessee. Lily was seriously wounded in the thigh on October 28th and was taken to a Bridgeport, Alabama hospital. After being shot and while being transported to the rear, there was also a Confederate soldier in the ambulance. And though both were cold and shivering, Second Lieutenant Oliver Brown of the 149th saw when Lily said to the enemy soldier, my friend, I guess I will have to share my blanket with you. And he then did so. Five days later, Brother Lily died on November 2nd, 1863, at the age of 34. Brother Lily's kindness toward the enemy soldier illustrated by deed the Masonic principles that each Mason strives to emulate. We can't know how many such instances occurred between Mason and non-Mason. But there are certainly many documented instances during the Civil War where Masonic brothers reached across both Union and Confederate battle lines to show each other brotherly love. Brother Lilly's brave, calm action at the Battle of Gettysburg was commemorated in a painting called Mending the Flag by Edwin Forbes, an artist hired to document the war by Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper. 29 years later, a bronze plaque of William C. Lilly's, William C. Lilly's action was made. Was made after a reunion of the 149th Regiment in 1892. The plaque was placed on their monument at Culp's Hill in Gettysburg. Input from brother, Gen brother and general Henry A. Barnum, who commanded the 149th at Gettysburg as a colonel, and from Please. Private George J. C. Saber, another 149th comrade in arms, was used in designing the plaque. The fact that the monument for the entire regiment reflects this calm, inspiring act shows what the members of the 149th cared about both during and after the war. To quote Ranger Daniel Vermilia of the Gettysburg National Military Park, the flag they carried was a symbol of all they fought to save. Preserving the flag was as important as preserving the Union, and Sergeant William C. Lilly's efforts helped to do both, giving the men strength to continue fighting in the midst of their most trying hours. During the dedication of the monument in 1892, Colonel Louis Stegman, leader of the 102nd New York Regiment at Gettysburg, said, And what of the 149th in these perilous hours? Right here it stood, here it fought, here it mastered the foe. In its historic character, in its, in it, it is part of Green's Brigade at Culp's Hill. But just upon this spot is defined its own personality. Here, Lily twice spliced the flagstaff, shot from his hands as he reared them aloft, riddled and torn by 80 gaping wounds. Does that tell a tale? It means that where that flag stood was an ordeal of death, that the men who defended it that night and that next day, who fired their muskets and held their swords, were worthy to be enshrined with the noblest, the bravest, and the truest of soldiers who have ever lived in any generation. 
Here they proved a heroism never surpassed in the annals of warfare. Two months after Brother Lilly's death in 1863, on January 1st, 1864, the Syracuse Daily Standard printed, one of the saddest scenes of the war in this city transpired to yesterday. The remains of seven of the noblest soldiers of the 149th Regiment, killed at Lookout Mountain, were received for internment. The names of the dead were Color Sergeant William C. Lilly, Sergeant J.H. Johnson, Sergeant Jeremiah McCarthy, Corporal James Hayes, Moses Rothschilds, James E. Mills, and Frank Van Atten. Their remains, which had been interred by their comrades near where they died, were disinterred, placed in metallic burial cases, and brought home by Messrs. John Ryan and S.P. Rust, undertakers, who were deputized to perform this service by the friends of the deceased. From Cincinnati to this city, they were accompanied by Colonel Barnum and Sergeant Major Birdseye. The bodies reached this city at 25 minutes past 10 in the forenoon and were received at the cars by Company C, 51st Regiment, and a large concourse of citizens. Each of the coffins was placed in a hearse provided for it, and a procession was formed under the direction of Colonel G. J. Dean Hawley to escort them to the city hall. The procession was headed by Drescher's band playing the dirge. Following were the seven hearses between the files of the National Guard, which marched in open order at intervals. After the hearses were barouche sleighs occupied by the following members of the 149th, Colonel H.A. Barnum, Lieutenant Colonel C.B. Randall, Major A.G. Cook, who was also a brother from Central City Number 305, Captain J.E. Doran, Captain J. Lynch, Lieutenant G.K. Collins, Lieutenant A. McKinstry, Lieutenant Thomas Merriam, Lieutenant O. Coville, Sergeant Major M.D. Birdseye, and Surgeons A.W. Phillips and H.F. Adams, and by Mayor Bookstaver, Colonel Hawley, Lieutenant Colonel Sniper, and Major Fellows. A sad procession. Seven dead soldiers and eight of their officers doing them honor. Colonel Barnum, with the ghastly wound to his side, received nearly two years ago at Melbourne Hill, and with the newer wound received on that memorable day on the mountain of Chattanooga, making it necessary to carry his arm in a sling. Lieutenant Colonel Randall, with the wound of Gettysburg in his neck and breast broken open again, himself worn down with suffering and hard campaigning to the mere shadow of his former self. Major Cook, crippled and in constant pain from the terrible wound in his foot, never to be forgotten remembrance of that day at Chancellorsville, when he fought the regiment through its first fight. The sight of these and their not less brave comrades and the dead woke feelings of <coughs> deepest sadness in the throng that lined the streets through which the cortege marched. The course went to City Hall, where there the bodies lay in state, surrounded by a detail of the National Guard until three o'clock when they were delivered to their respective friends. After the coffins had been arranged and the guard posted and the crowd filled the hall, Colonel, Burnham, Colonel and Brother Barnum addressed Mayor Bookstaver as follows. Sirs, we return to you from the barren wilds of far off Chattanooga and the beetling cliffs of Lookout Mountain, the remains of seven of the brave men who but a year ago left friends and home to march forth into battle for that which every patriot is dearer than friends, far more precious than home, an imperiled country. Bravely have these noble men done their work, as the bloody record of many a hard-fought field will attest. They have been rudely plucked from my the flower of my command, and are deeply mourned by the brave comrades they have left behind. They ask no sympathy, they need not your kindness, but in behalf of their comrades of the field, not one of whom knows how soon he, too, may fall. And the bereaved relatives, I bespeak your tender care to these cold remains, your honorable recognition of their services and their sacrifices. And oh, remember that amid your holiday claims, there are mingled the widow's deep-drawn moans, the orphan's plaintive cry, and parents, brothers, and sisters inconsolable lamenting. Mayor Bookstaver replied as follows, Colonel Burnham, this occasion is indeed a sad contrast to the time when these, this people assembled to cheer you and your brave comrades, 
and wish you a Godspeed and safe return from the perils of the battlefield, with you we're going to protect the honor of our national flag and avenge our country's wrong. Then, those who now lie before us cold in death, went forth in the heyday of youth, rejoicing in the power of their strength. And with what unflinching, manly, and daring courage they met the shock of battle, their cold and dead bodies, more eloquent than words, to truthfully attest. I see around me today many who cheered those brave men as they left their homes and friends, now dropping a tear over their remains as a last sad tribute of respect for these departed brave. Never before has a people made history as rapidly as we are doing now, and the presence of the remains of these brave soldiers deeply impresses us that this war is fast thickening around us, like smoke on the battlefield, amid the wails and groans of thousands slaughtered in defense of their country for constitution and laws, until almost every household is filled with mourning, Rachel's, who will not be comforted because their sons are not. I trust in God we may soon have an honorable, glorious peace, alike honorable to us as Christians as well as a nation. War is not the normal condition of mankind, but peace. War springs from hell, peace descends from heaven. That you and I and all of us may quickly see a glorious and triumphant peace surrounded by prosperity, a restored union and an unbroken constitution is my earnest prayer. Thanking you for the deep interest and generous sympathy you have shown toward the deceased, we will now leave the remains to the kindly care of their respective relatives and friends. In 1901, Captain George Collins wrote, to me, to the present generation, this flag means little, but to me it is almost as dear as my life. Often I go to the county clerk's office and look at it lovingly, and as I do so, the tears invariably creep into my eyes as I think what that old flag <coughs> means to me and to all the members of the old 149th Regiment. They worship that flag and prize it as one of the most precious of their earthly possessions. The scene of Brother Lily's fixing the flag was also included in Cyrus Dallin's bronze sculpture at the Soldiers and Sailors Monument in Clinton Square, Syracuse. This sculpture won first prize in a 1906 competition. Although Brother William C. Lilly was a Freemason for only five years and a Royal Arch Mason for only four, his attachment to the fraternity was such that while at war, he took the time to carve this exquisite pendant in cherry wood, carefully carving the symbols and fill them with what I believe is red sealing wax. That the pendant survived Brother Lilly's 15 month journey from Syracuse, New York to Chancellorsville, Virginia, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania and Chattanooga, Tennessee and from there to the hospital in Bridgeport, Alabama, and from there back up to his Royal Arch chapter brothers, all the way back to Onondaga County in northern New York State, says something profound about the respect and love felt for and within the fraternity. I feel quite certain that further research will show that some of the men involved with getting Brother Lily and his fallen comrades home were Freemasons. Somehow, his pendant made it back. <coughs> How many small wooden pendants were carved by soldiers during Civil War? How many remain for us to see today? What condition are they in? This small carving carries the weight of so many layers of meaning. It sheds light on the personal life of a Civil War hero, reflecting where his thoughts were when he had a bit of time while at war. Its survival remains a testament to the cohesion felt within the Masonic fraternity and within the companions of the Royal Arch Masons. The symbols themselves have Masonic meanings, which you would need to join the Royal Arch to find out. The pendant was donated to the Livingston Masonic Library by Right Worshipful Herbert W. Greenland, who was raised in Syracuse Lodge Number 501, which, which came out of Syracuse Lodge Number 102 in 1874. Right Worshipful Greenland was also a member of Central City Chapter Number 70, the same Royal Arts chapter as Brother Lily. From 1909, Right Worshipful Greenland was also a member of the Grand Lodge 
Committee on Antiquities, and it is he who we have to thank for the depositing of Brother William C. Lilly's pendant into our collections. In 2011, the United Grand Lodge of England discovered my online record about the artifact and borrowed it for their exhibit, The Patriot Mason, Freemasonry in American Society. This Royal Arch pendant, made by Color Sergeant and Brother William C. Lilly, has traveled well. So what's the big deal with one small artifact? Sometimes it's a lot. So thank you for coming to hear this story about a Brother Mason raised into the fraternity 158 years ago. Please don't hesitate if you have any questions and I'll try to answer them. If I don't immediately know the answer, you can be sure the rare, extensive, and spectacular resources of the Chancellor Robert R. Livingston Masonic Library of the Grand Lodge of New York will be able to shed some light on any question involving Freemasonry and the prominent and non-prominent members found entwined throughout the history of New York State. Thank you. one of which was my great-great-grandfather, wow. George Wheeler Shepherd, who wow. buried at Gettysburg. Wow. Masonic uh, square and compass on their breastplate. How true to form is that? Very, actually. Um, I had I had pulled together two of references of that exact specific nature. Um, one of them was uh, at the Battle of Bull Run. You had, uh, and this is in our artifact collection as well. There is a. It's about this big and it's done in hand calligraphy in about 50 different fonts. You think we have fonts. This is, you can hardly read some of them, but there are, there's a, a scene at the top and three soldiers, uh, portraits of photographs put in the top and at the bottom of, of, of another portrait of a southern soldier. And what happened is these three soldiers from the north were all severely wounded at uh, Manassas, the second bull run. And um, they were dying, and they had uh, given each other as much attention to their wounds as they could, uh, but then um, they realized they were gonna die pretty soon. It was the second night of the battle. Um, and uh, brother Hugh Barr came by, and he, had, he saw a Masonic emblem on one of those three soldiers, and uh, he said, recognized in us brothers in distress by means of a Masonic emblem on the shirt of Captain Mosscroft. Brother Barr immediately rendered all assistance within his power by procuring the services of Surgeon Jackson, who extracted the balls from our persons and properly dressed our wounds. On the following morning, Brother Barr came in person with an ambulance and removed us to the Van Pell House Hospital from which place we were parted, sent to Washington, D.C., September 7th, 1862. And this is what's written on this thing. Uh, now, therefore, in recognition and remembrance of the brotherly love and hum humanity of Brother Hugh Barr, as exemplified on this to us trying occasion, we tender to him this testament not only for its <coughs> intrinsic value, but as a token of brotherly wishes for his future um, a token of brotherly love and esteem, and as an assurance of our authority's wishes for his future health and happiness. And uh, another one which is very famously celebrated uh, resulted in the Friend to Friend statue uh, at the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania, where um, uh, 
a, a Confederate uh, brother was dying and a Northern brother came by and he was, he, uh, the brother who was dying was Louis Armistead and he was very good friends with um, uh, brother General Winfield Scott Hancock. And he asked the brother who came by to give brother Hancock his watch and let him know where he was. So those are just two instances and um, there's a book written recently by the past Grand Master of uh, Kansas, Michael A. Halloran, and it's called The Better Angels of Our, Nat the Better Angels of Our Nature, uh, Freemasonry in the American Civil War. And um, I'm sure he has a lot more examples in there. So yeah, it's very true. Um, they did wear them. I actually have that book and I've, I've spent a couple of evenings with uh, Mike Halloran myself. Yeah. My, my point in question was the reproduction that we wear now, how close to... Oh, how close to the actual ones. That I would have to see. I don't know what, I don't know what you wear nowadays. I do know I have one in the collection that I believe is... They weren't very... Um, the one I have is not very expensively made. You know, it's a very light thing. Um, so I, I, would, I wouldn't know exactly until I saw what it was that was being worn today, how well, close or how far yes, away. There's probably one around here right now. Well, I'll be here all day tomorrow You'll too, so. I'm <laughs> actually looking forward to it. I've never been to a reenactment before, so. Thank you. You're welcome. And any other questions or comments? Just to reiterate, everybody is completely welcome to come down to New York or access our resources on the online website that we have set up. So, Master. Well, Catherine, thank you on behalf of uh, the Lodge. Thank you very much for the trip today and, and the stewardship that you gave to the history uh, presentation tonight and, and certainly tomorrow representing the Livingston Library uh, here at the uh, Museum Village. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.